Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 288. More magic, please. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rofberg. And last week, we started a series of episodes on the Shemitah year, the sabbatical year that's coming up in just a few weeks, starting this coming Rosh Hashanah. The sabbatical year is a year that comes every seven years on the Jewish calendar, and things are supposed to be somewhat different in that seventh year. One of the questions that we're exploring here on this show is, in what way should they be different? The Torah focuses on two main things, that you shouldn't be cultivating the land, the land should be resting, and that debts should be forgiven. And for all kinds of complex reasons, the rabbis of the Talmud didn't really do a lot with the concept of Shemitah to update it for relevancy outside of the land of Israel or outside of the world of agriculture for the most part. And we're thinking that now the time has come to really try to do something with this concept of the Shemitah, the sabbatical year. We're not alone. Last week, we interviewed Hannah Nib Henza and Sarah Zell Young of the Shemitah Project that's run out of Chazon, that's really trying to create a national movement to take the Shemitah really seriously and to think about ways to make it relevant for our time. Among the various parts of the Shemitah Project is a kind of competition in which artists are able to submit various artistic ideas related to Shemitah. One of the submissions to this Shemitah Project contest is a kind of a game created by our guest today, Eli Kaplan Wildman. It's called Shemitah Steps. And right now it's only a conceptual idea because it costs a lot of money to bring something from concept to fruition. So you can't order Shemitah Steps today. You can see a video about it that's linked to in our show notes for today's episode. But more broadly, we're going to be talking about the way that an artist, that a working artist, can play a unique role in reimagining Jewish objects and maybe Jewish rituals more broadly. Before coming up with this idea for Shemitah Steps, Eli Kaplan Wildman has created a number of other Jewish ritual objects. In fact, the first thing that he created is something called Unbound, the recreated Haggadah. Now, his Unbound Haggadah is unbound in the sense that it is a book without a binding. It's a Haggadah in the form of 12 large cards that can be interacted with in all kinds of new ways because it's not a book with a binding. It's unbound. That Haggadah created a splash a few years ago. I bought one. I think it's really great. And building on the name of that Haggadah, Eli Kaplan Wildman is also using the name Unbound for his work. You can see his Jewish creations at a site called Create Unbound, and you can get there by going to www.unboundjerusalem.com. In his life outside of the creation of Jewish ritual objects, Eli Kaplan Wildman is a designer for theater and urban installations. He has not only been a theater designer, but also a director, producer, and writer. He trained in New York and worked on Broadway and TV shows. In his Jewish work, he founded Unbound Jerusalem, a studio that designs tactile experiential books. But you have to understand books in a very broad way, and we really encourage you to go to his site and check them out. His Jewish creations have reached thousands of people through associations with major organizations like PJ Library, Central Synagogue in Manhattan, and the Schusterman Foundation. In Jerusalem, where he lives, he is the leader of egalitarian, queer, and artistic communities. Just one more word about Shemitah Steps. In Eli Kaplan Wildman's words, it is a prototype for an item that brings the values of Shemitah to life using both ritual, a Shemitah Seder plate and ceremony, as well as play, a redistribution of wealth board game. We'll talk more about that in our conversation. And so, Eli Kaplan Wildman, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. Thank you. I should note for our listeners that we're here under a legal agreement because uh, (laughs) since we both have the name Unbound in our name, uh, the lawyer said we had to feature you on the podcast in order to avoid a cease and desist letter and vice versa. So thank you for for that. (laughs) Yes, it's always nice when you get to talk about mutual cease and desist agreement. (laughs) By the way, for our listeners, that's actually a lie. I'm getting all these ideas about cease and desist letters. (laughs) Yeah, I think we we had it first. But anyway... um, 
So I wanted to start by asking you about something that I heard you talking about in one of the videos on your website, where you talked about that you had a past history as a magician and that there was something about magic that's relevant to the work of making Jewish objects or whatever we want to call it exactly. Could you talk more about that, that idea and why magic is relevant? Yeah, I started doing magic, uh, just to be clear, when I was really a child. So since I was six, seven, I had this kind of childhood obsession with magic tricks. And my I think it was convenient for my grandparents and the people around me because they always could like just get me a pack of cards or a little rope trick for my birthday. And I would be elated and they would have, you know, done their jobs as grandparents. But what it ended up happening was that I got obsessed with this. I performed as a magician at people's parties. And my first instinct was to to do this as a child. And so that means something about who I was then and who I would become in a way. And after that, I went to become a theater designer and director. And so when I started working on Jewish ritual objects, it really is just the continuation of the same path that I was on since I was doing card tricks in the living room or trying to hide things in my palm and do sleight of hand with like tiny six-year-old hands, which I'm sure my parents were lovely about pretending to be surprised by these things. But surprise really is at the basis of magic, putting on a show audiences knowing that they're coming to be entertained. I feel in theater, sometimes you cut a little more slack to like a play. It's allowed to be boring for a little bit, but a magician's not really allowed to be boring. He's supposed to be entertaining you. You're like, I showed up. I want to see a show. When we are in a ritual moment, we don't want to be seeing a show. We want it to be interactive, but we we want to be engaged and we want to be surprised and we want to be drawn in. And that is something that I find is often missing from like the thinking around ritual objects. I feel a lot of rabbis and the people who are running services do put thought into the services themselves. But when we think of the objects and the creation of new objects in in Jewish ritual, I really enjoy bringing that in because I think that it's missing. Yeah, it makes me think about what I would say is probably my favorite Jewish ritual object, although I think there are a lot of people, including my wife, who probably makes fun of me and says we can't get one. But, you know, it's that object for Kiddush, for the blessing over the wine on a Friday night, where there's a cup of wine and then you pour it into the middle and the wine kind of flows out into all these smaller cups and each of the kids or whoever can take one. And there's actually a kind of ritual meaning for it in the sense that everybody's getting wine from the cup that the blessing was actually made over without having to actually share and drink from the same cup, which especially in COVID times, you can understand why that's not a great idea. So it's both functional and magical. And yet I've never actually had one of those. I've always wished I had one. And I can imagine that after the fourth week, everybody knows what it does and it's kind of not that magical anymore. And I guess my question is, how do you think about the idea of keeping the magic going? That is a hard question because I think, first of all, it's the question that we always have in religion. That's the that's the big question. Anyone who's a Jewish educator or deals with ritual and holidays and education has this problem. It's what? It's Passover again. You know, it's Rosh Hashanah again. I will say about that specific object, we used to have one and every time I thought it was so cool and it would be interesting to make one of those and find the way to bring some visual element to it that isn't just the little trick of the the pipes that run in different directions with the wine, but that has further meaning beyond it. The idea of Kiddush, that ceremony that we make, the blessing of the wine on Shabbat, is about creation. It's about the moment that God created the world. And if you were to think, I or you, anyone, as a Jewish artist or a Jewish maker, if we were to think about the ideas that are behind elevating our wine and sanctifying it and 
reminding ourselves of the first Shabbat, the first Sabbath that was after creation. There's so many ideas about creation and making something from nothing and making Eden, the Garden of Eden, and the rivers that flowed out from Eden. There's so many different ideas that are very visual that could be incorporated into a piece like that. If ideas like that have enough detail in them uh, visually, then there can always be something new to find, something hidden. Um, we go through our rituals so quickly anyway that we'll probably miss most of what's on this item. And if we hide little clues all around it, there can always be something new. And then when a new generation comes, new kids, new friends, new guests, showing them and becoming the teacher to show off your object, that's the new thing and showing it to someone else. I was talking to somebody recently, and I'm actually forgetting who, and I apologize to them, but they invoked Arthur Wasco, who is one of our teachers on this show, and also, I, I think, one of the, the preeminent teachers for Shemitah this upcoming sabbatical year and thinking about tying Judaism to ecology. So they said, Arthur Wasco once said, the angel Gabriel himself could come down in the middle of Shabbat services, and like you could have a voice from heaven and after the third or fourth week of that, it would get tired. I love so many Jewish rituals, but really what I love is them changing. And so what you're talking about with surprise and even with magic, I feel like Jewish rituals need magic. And to go into Shemitah, to go into the ritual object that is Shemitah steps, I'm curious how you, like what contribution you could see that making to Shemitah. Because from my perspective, um, I've said this about music. I've said like, until Shemitah has a soundtrack, until Shemitah has songs, like until it has something like that, Shemitah is not going to stick for people. And I think the same is true with ritual objects. Until Shemitah has like stuff you can touch that ties you to the ritual, I don't know that it's going to stick, but I see your Shemitah steps as potentially the kind of ritual object you could touch, you could use that does that, that serves that function. So A, I'm curious if you could outline what it is, and B, if the purpose I'm outlining for it is aligned with what you perceive it as being. The idea of Shemitah Steps in general is to bring Shemitah into our modern lives using ritual and play. We're on a podcast and all my work is very visual. So everyone will have to just listen to me describing these items. And then hopefully at some point you can find all this stuff online. And I'm Go sure to our show notes. Just sorry to interrupt, but we, we will have abundant visuals in our show notes on the Judaism Abound website for this episode. Perfect. Um, Shemitah Steps comes with six tiles that, that uh, can sit on your table. They're hexagonal. They're kind of like a Seder plate for Shemitah. That's the way to think about it. And you put them out on your table and they invite you to place a different object on each item. And that object represents a one of the pillars or ideas behind Shemitah. So there are these six tiles and they each represent one of the driving forces behind Shemitah that come together to create this year of rest and renewal. And in answer to one of your previous questions, Lex, about ritual getting old, the way I see Shemitah steps being used is that you put it out every week and you use it. And each of these tiles has both the idea of Shemitah th that that tile represents, but it also has a question. The question is something like, why do we feel better when we give to someone in need? And this is on the tile that represents the cup. And what will make ritual interesting and not get old is when it recognizes the fact that we change and we are always different. We always have something different to say. We've always had a, a different type of experience. And the idea of a repetitive ritual is not to do the repetitive ritual. It's that we use that ritual as a tool to look into ourselves. And we're always different and we've always seen something different. We're always thinking about something different. We're in a good place. We're in a bad place. And the ritual is there for us always, wherever, whenever, wherever we're at. And um, that's what I see Shemitah Steps doing. It's taking these six ideas behind Shemitah 
And every week or every day or once a month during Shemitah, thinking to myself, wait, where am I in relation to all these ideas? Am I appreciating the earth as much as I should? Am I thinking about the source of my food? Did I used to think about the source of my food? But now that I'm in this like crazy mode at work, I just don't think about what's in the gross hamburger that I ordered in Shuntev. It's this reminder that we should be using these tools to affect our lives. That's the idea. We're not doing the ritual for, I mean, dare I say this, we're not doing the ritual for God. We are doing the ritual for ourselves. And if we don't find meaning in the ritual, if it doesn't affect our lives and make us think about our own selves, then we're going to stop doing the ritual, um, which is why I made Shemitah steps. We need something physical, not necessarily really physical, but a tangible manifestation of this idea of Shemitah, because Shemitah, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you've been talking about this and, you know, everyone's hearing a lot about Shemitah. It's this ancient thing from when our lives used to be governed by something else. Our lives used to be agricultural. So obviously it was hard to miss something like Shemitah. But now when our food grows on trees that are in the supermarket and, you know, we don't, what's the joke? Like I would do great at finding my own food if I only knew what tree sandwiches grew on. (laughs) I think that's it. Anyway, you know, we don't know where our food comes from. We don't, we're not, or, and if we know we're not connected to it in the right way. So we need these, these objects to remind us. And also we don't want it to just be all serious. And that's why my Shemitah steps object when you turn it over, if you've been doing this throughout dinner or like with your friends um, over dessert or when the drinks come out, you can turn it over and it actually contains a, the, the tiles kind of come together and it contains a cooperative strategy board game about the redistribution of wealth, which is connected both to Shemitah and to the Yovel, which is this even crazier idea than Shemitah, um, which is the the 50th year after seven cycles of Shemitah comes the Yovel, which is this socialist and revolutionary. Um, there are theories that it never, ever even happened once, basically, um, but that it's this thing we're supposed to strive to about equality and redistribution of wealth and all these ideas, which we are talking about all the time uh, amongst ourselves. So there, it's a fun way to kind of suspensefully and in with humor uh there's there's kind of cards that are all really funny and little places you put your pieces that are also funny um and that's the kind of playful maybe magical maybe surprising and always changing uh other side of this item i I wanted to sit with what you said about you know dare i say it's not for god one could hear that as radical Etc. But I actually think there's something about that just that just feels like by the book true. Like there's rituals in the Torah that are for God. Do these sacrifices? It will be a reach nichoach. It will be a pleasant odor for God. Like it's clear that the sacrifices that are done, like that's the purpose of them, is to serve this being. The smell goes to God. That's why you do these sacrifices. Shmita, God wants the land to benefit. Like, like this is for. The land, it, in the way that it talks about a pleasant aroma for Hashem, for God, with these sacrifices, it talks about it will be a Sabbath for the land, La'aretz. It does mention God right after that. It says like it's the Sabbath, La'aretz, for the land. And then it also says for God, but God comes second. And so I think it's not particularly radical for us to say, you know what, God, you, you take a seat for a second. This is something else. So I, I wanted to not skirt by that because I think there's something really powerful that we have an ancient ritual that I would argue is not specifically for God, even as God is sort of involved. And so my question to you is like, what do we do with that? Like, like how, what's the takeaway from, okay, this isn't about God. This is about us. Like, how would you break down orienting to that through like, it's about me individual. It's about us community. It's about Jews as a collective. It's about the world. Most laws are not for God. They're between people. And the laws that are between a person and God 
when you look at them, it's if you like psychoanalyze them, it's really for us. It's so clear mm-hmm. that these are just things that people need. And whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, whether God is a being or not a being, or whether God has a nose and can smell <laughs> sacrifices or not, there's no way to um, manifest that concept. And Judaism must know that, right? It must be clear to whoever started this religion or however you think about it, that you can't define things based on God because you don't know what someone's thinking when they think about God. But we do know what we're thinking when we think about ourselves and what our own human experience of the world is. So that's all we have to work with, our own human experience. And in the context of Shemitah, we have to kind of take a further step back because we as contemporary people don't have the same experience that Shemitah is talking about. So within that, the Shemitah cards work with what we've got. And what have we got? We have people, society, and all the kind of things in between that, our family, um, the, the people sitting around our table. It's about community at the end of the day. Uh, you can use the Shemitah cards by yourself, but I think this ritual, like the Seder plate, I feel, and the Seder, uh, was made to, to, to happen together. And it's a time for us to take a step back, look at where we are. You know, we obviously are not letting the land rest, but what is Shemitah now? And how are we going to celebrate Shemitah now? How does this relate to us? And, you know, we're not going to get an answer from the rabbis, the dead white men, about what this, the actual answer is. How we do do Shemitah today? So we have to come up with the answer. And what, as a society, do we want to emphasize in a year that's about rest and renewal? So can we talk more broadly about how you go about reimagining a ritual object or other things? It's not all you've done in the Jewish sphere in particular. So somebody hands you this challenge. Uh, what are the steps you go through to create a new version of, of that ritual object? So my process draws on the process of theater because that's where I come from. And in theater, what you are given is a text, a script, words on a page, black and white with nothing. And the distance between that and a show is very, very big. And a lot of people don't, unless you do theater, you don't really realize how much a director, a set designer, an actor, um, how much of an effect they can have on how different the show is. And that's why there are a million productions of Romeo and Juliet, and they're, they're all different. And two different productions can look completely different and both be very good and very true to the story. So to me, that's my model for how I work as a designer, where you you look at kind of the bare bones and then you have to think, well, within these bare bones, this script, whether it's a play by Tennessee Williams or whether it's a ritual from Judaism, what's the deeper part of that? What's the bare bones of the bare bones, right? What's in, in theater, we always ask, what's the story, right? Which, which doesn't mean what the plot is. It means what's the story. And within a certain plot, people can find different stories. Is it about someone trying to break free? Is it about some, actually we're more interested in the person who's trying to keep that person in the cage. And when you make those decisions about what is the, the, the skeleton of this, It's not the only interesting part to me, but that's the most important thing. It's deciding, well, what am I doing with this? And with Shemitah, it was just like that. And I literally was sitting, I was like, I want to do something for Shemitah. I don't tend to look at what others have done with that exact thing. So like with a show, let's say you were going to put on Alice in Wonderland. The last thing I, as a designer, want to look at is other pictures of other people doing Alice in Wonderland. I want the opposite. I want to think, okay, Alice in Wonderland, I'm going to make it be about the queen and this whole relationship of like different heights and levels and hierarchies. And so then I'll look at structures and pictures of, you know, 
I, I'm a big Pinterest person. And amazingly, people say they know all this information about us, the internet. Pinterest knows me better than Google <laughs> knows me better than anyone. I open Pinterest. It just knows what to, to give me stuff about light and shapes and I don't know, art installations. I love looking at art installations, going to museums. That's for me, the sort of research uh, side of things is, is looking at both looking and reading and experiencing what these different inspirations can be. Um, and then within that kind of picking and paring it down, and I always finish with a collage that I usually can kind of print out. That's just the, the six central images to, to this thing. And and once you're there, those six images will tell a pretty clear story. In the end, I'll reach the, I'll, I'll know what I'm doing. Once I know what I'm doing, uh, the making it pretty part and making it something that you really want to just reach out and grab and, and use, that's the fun part and also very important because it's about design. We see design everywhere in our lives now. Everything is perfectly designed. Obviously, all our apps, all the sort of user interfaces we see digitally are thoroughly thought through and tested. And, you know, these days an app, we don't have, have instructions anymore. You're supposed to be able to open an app and just know how to use it without any instructions. And even food, they've thought of where your thumb goes and how you're going to open the package. Where is that in Judaism? Where is our UX? User experience. Someone having thought of what's going to happen. And so for me, that's the, la the sort of the final stage. Um, very important, but it doesn't matter how well you do that stage. If your initial, like you have to really have a good bones, a good kind of skeleton for it to all come together. I feel like we just got a little bit of a window into your into your frustration and i'm saying that positively like uh, with with guests we have and breaking the fourth wall and giving like our process or my process i often am trying to find like the axe to grind like the thing that wasn't there jewishly that somebody felt so annoyed about that they went and made a thing to so that that gap is now filled and i feel like i'm starting to get a sense of what that is for you but i want more on that because i'm very energized just soaking that in from you so like what i'm really getting at i'm going to say some more things but what i really am curious about is like when you compare your ritual objects what you create to like a classical for lack of a better term ritual object not that they're all the same but like what is yours doing that those generally aren't and as an example of what i mean i mean i have my own frustration or axe to grind with certain Jewish rituals, one of them being Torah study. Um, I hate how most text studies go, where you have a, a packet of stapled pieces of paper, usually with six or nine or 11 sources, and they're very linear. You start with number one, and there's number two, and then and maybe you're hopping between them. But I think the structure of it with the linearity of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine that doesn't lend itself to a compelling text study. And it also, as the facilitator, you're claiming power over the order that things will go. And you're saying, like, you know you're going to get to the first source. You don't know if you're going to get to the later one. And so when I do text studies, if I have a source sheet at all, which I don't always, I tend to make it look like a Talmud page. I tend to have something in the middle and then a bunch of texts around it on all the sides. And I give people five minutes to just like browse randomly, to just like let their eye wander where it does. Sometimes I have pictures as part of this page. And for me, I think that the conversations often end up way better. And they go in directions I didn't expect because I didn't decide beforehand what direction the conversation is going to go. And I just like threw a bunch of these sources. Sometimes we end up talking about the source I was like least interested in and put in at the last minute because people's eye went there. And so, like, my question is, what's your equivalent to that? Like, what's your frustration with an old school Haggadah such that you created the your unbound Haggadah? Because I think most people's instinct is like, oh, there's all these Haggadahs and I don't like them very much. So I'm going to make my own Haggadah. But they don't upend the structure of a Haggadah. They make another book that flows like most Haggadahs do, and they just have a different theme or they emphasize a different part. But what you tend to do, at least my understanding, is more structural than that. 
And I think that's the kind of thinking we need. So I'm curious to learn more about like the specifics of what is frustrating you that you are then looking to transcend in your ritual objects. First of all, I love Judaism. <laughs> uh, so having an ax to grind is like, feels so harsh to say, but you're totally right, of course. It's interesting when you talk about a Torah sheet, I was thinking about how this relates to what we were talking about regarding surprise and theater. You know, I would never ask the audience to walk into a show holding the script. You know, it's like, no, you have some suspense. And certainly, uh, so I rarely teach text study. Um, and if and when I do, I definitely don't have a source sheet where it's kind of laid out like that. In terms of why am I doing this, basically, it's because I think Judaism has so many cool, awesome things in it. I'm, I'm often very naive in how I think. And I think Judaism is just so fun. And there's so many great little pockets of things that no one is aware enough of. I, I give the example of Kiddush Levana, the blessing over the new moon, this random basically pagan ritual stuck a Jewish title on because people mm -hmm. were doing it anyway, this pagan ritual. And so they kind of just quickly made it Jewish so that all these people would be doing something Jewish. And it's super cool. And the thing, if you read it and study it, the things it talks about are so interesting. And it's brought as an option to be included in a gay wedding service because it speaks about equality. It, it has a blessing in it that wishes for a time when the sun and the moon, their light will be equal. And that's so cool. And the fact that our religion has this little thing in it where you could take this ritual that we say, and most people just kind of mumble through that part and don't even realize the weight of uh, such a blessing, but that these, um, these, these elements of Judaism need to be brought out and shown to people. And the way I know how to do that in a way that people will be engaged in is using design. And for me, design goes back to these ideas I was talking about regarding surprise, misdirection, and wonder. If you bring those three elements into some random thing like this blessing, people will come. If you say, I'm going to, you know, let's study Kiddush Levana, the ancient ritual of blessing the moon. Like that sounds like a snooze fest. And it's so sad to me when I see this is my ax, right? Here it is. Okay, we found it. <laughs> it's so sad when I see people turning, Jewish people turning outside of Judaism for things that we have. Do you agree, though, that there's an element of design, of taking things away, right, of, of making the design simpler and simpler? And I feel like there's a certain version of Judaism. I don't think it's the right version. I don't think it's the authentic or exclusive or oldest version. But there's a certain version of Judaism that always wants to add and never wants to remove. And so you end up, I think, and this is why I want to ask an expert designer, you end up with something cluttered that might have beauty in it, but that beauty becomes inaccessible because you can't find it in the clutter. And I, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about how you address that as a designer. I was even thinking about your Unbound Haggadah, which I have to say I love and everybody should buy one. And I'm I as I'm like as I'm listening to you and I'm kind of like looking at it in my hands right now, I'm thinking like, what would it look like? What would the 2.0 version look like that doesn't have the full text of the traditional Haggadah in it? Like, is there a way that we could make it even more unbound by having less? And what would that look like? It's a Jewish podcast. We have to, this, like, it's going to get to the roots. So I grew up in a traditional, you know, observant family. And um, I'm relatively in that place today in my own practice. And in that world, I would say, yes, like you're saying, more is more. Let's add more and more layers and more and more and more. And there is a problem with that. And I think that's what I'm talking about when I speak about undiscovered pockets of Judaism, 
they're, they're right there. They're just covered with other stuff and surrounded by other stuff. So on the one hand, yes, we do need to take away. On the other hand, I love the clutter of Judaism. And there's something about Judaism that's messy, that's personal, that's, you know, your own thing. And um, that's important. And I don't think we want to lose that. And it's part of the work is how, basically how clean is this object going to be? And the Haggadah is a great example of like, at least my maximum level of clutter. Both, it's sort of the first thing I made. So I think there was also an element of, you know, I, I just was experimenting with, with it in general. A, B, the seder itself is a very cluttered ceremony. It's not linear in any way. It doesn't progress in according to any apparent logic. Uh, it's a mess, basically, the seder. And the, the ceremony and the Seder itself, the thing that happens in your house at your table with the crumbs and the juice and everything, that's also a mess. And another reason to have like maximum amount of stuff in the Haggadah is because you're literally going to be sitting there for hours holding it. And I really wanted to fill it visually with surprises and little things that you're like, wow, I've been using this Haggadah for three years. And only now do I see that there's a rabbit in it. Why is there a rabbit in the Haggadah? Well, let me go read about it and Google the, this whole idea of rabbits in Haggadot, which is actually a thing. Um, there's the maximalist idea. And then when I approach a project, I definitely think about, well, you know, how many layers do we want here? Because in Judaism, you, there's always layers. And the word Shema Israel, Shema, how do you translate Shema? There's like 50 ways to say it. And when you do work visually, you're able to express all 50 ways on one page because the picture is worth, you know, those 50 words. So you can create that same multiplicity and like endless layers on the page. And it's a big question. How much of that are you going to shove on your unsuspecting audience? I really want to get more insight from you on the theater front, because I think there's, there's like a hidden controversy or, or divide or something in Jewish life. There's lots of blatant controversies in Jewish life, but there's, this one is more hidden where I think whether Jewish ritual or the extent to which Jewish ritual should be experienced as performance is very different for, for different people. And as somebody who is occasionally at the front of a room leading a service, I've experienced that divide and that tension because some people like, and they'll say this directly to you, like, I go because I want to hear a person sing and soak in somebody else doing Jewish ritual. That's really not me. And it's actually like hard for me. Like I work very hard to try and understand that vantage point, but it's not me. There are other people that are more like me who like, if they're not participating, if they're not part of the ritual, if it's, if it's a form, if, if it's a performance in the sense of like wall between doers and watchers, they're not going to go. We're not going to go. Like I'm not, I'm not interested in doing that very much, but the last few years I've been kind of on a journey with this. Because I've realized that like, that's not really what performance is. I think when people say they resent Jewish ritual being a performance, what they mean is that they resent it when they're not invited to participate. But more and more, we look at theater and there's theatrical productions, there's experimental productions where like the audience is a character, the audience is participating in a wide variety of ways. And so I wanted to hear from that. Uh, I, I wanted to hear from you about that because I am somebody who by certain definitions of the word performance, would oppose Jewish ritual being that. But at the same time, I've actually the last few years noticed that like, oh, I went to that Purim event that was kind of a performance. It was like a theatrical shtick with all sorts of stuff. And I had a great time and it felt like one of the more meaningful Purims I've been to. Like, what's going on with that? Because I thought I didn't like performance as Jewish ritual. Oh, this other Jewish ritual that was like literally a performance moved me. So how could we maybe hone what we mean when we're talking about performance and ritual? Because I think we've constructed a divide between performative as not interactive and participatory as not performative that might not be telling the whole story. 
So first of all, about performance and theater, I have to say uh, that I use theater as my parallel just because that's the way I think. But that doesn't mean that I'm trying to make ritual objects that are performative or that are theater in any way. But yes, it's a huge and very interesting question. I will quote my one of my favorite musicals, which is called The Drowsy Chaperone, in which a person on stage is kind of like talking about the prayer he says before he uh, sees a show. And one of the things he says is, and please, God, keep the actors out of the audience. I didn't pay $95 to have the fourth wall crumbling all around me. So there is this feeling also in theater of like, oh my God, I do not want to be like attacked by actors. On the other hand, in theater, you see lots of interactive theater. And at the end of the day, I'll say something that's like annoying to say, but it's not about performative versus non-performative or interactive versus passive audience. It's about good and not good. And that's like kind of unhelpful way to define things, but you can have a completely fourth wall performance or ritual service where there's no interaction, but it is amazing and it touches you and you and the, the rabbi gave this sermon or the opera singer sung this aria and it, it just touched the inside of your heart and that can happen. And in the same token, a similar performance can just be absolutely nothingness. Also, interactive moments can be completely cringeworthy or amazing. And it's just about whether they were good or not good. And what that is, whether good or not good, that's very hard to define. So it's easy to get caught up in the definitions of like, well, you know, we sit in a circle because that's more interactive or it involves the audience more. That's not the conversation or it's part of it, but really it's just about, does it work or does it not work? And that is is harder to define, and I don't know the answer. And I think about this a lot in theater, for sure, uh, because in theater you have a very clear marker, right? This show was successful. The critics loved it. It made a lot of money, and that's great. And this show was unsuccessful. And um, when I lived in New York, I worked, I was a tiny little cog on the Broadway production, very, very tiny little cog on the set design studio of the Broadway production of Disney's The Little Mermaid, which had everything in its favor, everything. People walked into that theater waiting to fall in love with it. And everyone who was in that room as a creator was wildly successful people. And the musical was awful. Anyone who saw it knew that it was terrible, and it closed and it lost millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. And that was a big lesson for me in what is good and what is not good, what works and what doesn't work. In Judaism, it's kind of the same. You know, you have ritual leaders who are experienced and are trying to do the thing that touches people. And we have our script. We know, you know, what we're supposed to be working with. And some things just come together, some things don't. And that's kind of that. I, I, I hope that's a little bit helpful. Yeah, it is. And it really leads me to my final question, which is back to that, what you were saying about, you know, there's no way to know. And, you know, it's so interesting because I, I was going to ask you something along the lines of to get into some of your work where you teach workshops to regular people about, and and I've seen videos where they're using all these techniques that you teach them with cutting up paper and doing these amazing things actually. And I'm wondering whether in some way that opens a door to a vision of how we could get more of this done. Like maybe is there a way, cause I'm also thinking about Broadway shows or movies as being very collaborative enterprises where there's large teams of people working on something. And at the same time, there's also both in the world of Broadway or movies, you know, we think about the director who's the great genius or we, and we certainly, I think are tempted to look at things that way in, in Judaism, that there's some rabbi or some, you know, maybe in your case, you know, it's a, it's an object designer, but it has to, we have to find the one genius Whereas when I was listening to you, I was thinking, wow, I have a bunch of ideas, but I don't know Adobe Illustrator and I'm never going to learn how to use, you know, at home printing or any of those techniques. And certainly nothing of, to say about the 
the design capacities themselves. But I could imagine partnering with somebody like you, and I can imagine that it would be even be better if there was a whole team of people with a variety of skills that were doing these things. And like you say about The Little Mermaid, most of the time they would be total flops. But it feels to me like if we had a lot of people, a lot of different irons in the fire that way, we would come up with some really amazing things. And I'm also thinking in, in light of that, I'm thinking about an organization that I know you've done a bunch of work with, which is Central Synagogue in New York, which now because of COVID and because of the way that people are going online for Jewish activities in a way they never did before, it almost starts to feel like Central Synagogue is becoming almost this like mega synagogue because there are all these online members. I don't know if they're members they're paying or whatever, but there are these this whole online community. And so something that Central Synagogue does is now able to be scaled in a way that was not really possible before. And again, that's just another piece of the puzzle. And so I wonder if we reimagine how the puzzle of some of the pieces are now in place and, and we could sort of fantasize about what it might look like to have a much healthier environment of, of creativity and creation that that could really come up with some great stuff. So I just wanted to leave that with with you to fantasize a little bit, just because uh, as part of this thinking about the Shemitah, we're thinking about, well, maybe this is a year where we can just put out our fantasies of different futures. And, you know, maybe by speaking them, some will come true. Yes, let's imagine amazing new futures for Judaism. I will say another great leader, Amichai Laulavi, he said, artists are the new rabbis. And I think there's something in that just about how culture is so visual. And this is just something that I connect to. Culture is so visual. I don't think I would ever be a rabbi, but I feel like what I'm doing is this type of important work that's kind of bringing new light to Judaism um, and I hope that that's what rabbis, you know, see themselves as doing. Uh, speaking of great rabbis and central synagogue, it's a great example. Um, rabbi Angela Buchdahl, who is their senior rabbi and someone who really manages to bring people together. And in parallel to that, there is the idea of great leaders who everyone wants to get behind. Um, in terms of the future that I see, elevating the act of creating art, not just ritual objects or like the stained glass windows on your synagogue's windows, but the act of creating art, us creating art, us making things. We make things all the time. We curate our feed on Instagram. We design our little Instagram stories. We do this all the time. Let's do it in Judaism. Let's make things. And, you know, the workshops I lead are really uh, often people will forget the thing that they made on the table uh, and leave it. And I sort of have to put it in the recycling. And that is fine with me because it really it's not about the little piece of paper that they made. And I know that, and they know it too. It's about the moment where you took a Jewish idea, you processed it kind of through your mind, and then it came out through your hands into this, this item that you made. And, you know, sometimes when I do this, we kind of sit in silence and, and I really say like, let's have intention as we make this item, as, as you do this process. And that's what's important. And that's what I want the future to be. I want people to think of creation and creativity as worthy of elevation to the level of, of spiritual and ritual significance. When we let ourselves do that, we will love Judaism more because we'll think about it as something that we can easily take part in, and it'll just be a source of inspiration. And I want people to be inspired by Judaism, to look at it as something that they want to be a part of that has answers to their questions that can give a framework to the things that are happening in their lives, in their minds, in their community, in their hearts, in their families. I hope that everyone can create that world into being. Thank you so much, Ailey Kaplan-Wildman, for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you.
And thanks so much to all of you out there for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation and we hope that you'll tune in again in the future. We want to remind you that we've got more Shemitah prep episodes coming up. We hope you are really gearing up for this holiday year, for this year-long observance of sabbatical, of release, of recalibration, of reset, all the things that Shemitah is. And uh, there's more episodes that'll be coming in the next couple weeks. And then we'll be at Rosh Hashanah. It is nuts that we are so close, but that is, alas, the case. So get psyched. More Shemitah to come. It's going to be wonderful. And uh, if you're looking for a place to start thinking through what your Shemitah observance will look like, we are having Zoom gatherings each Friday of the month of Elul, of the final month of the Jewish calendar year before Rosh Hashanah. And uh, there's one, if you're listening to this on the release date of this episode, there's one today on August 20th, 2021. There will also be one next week and the week after that, the final two Fridays of Elul. So check those out. You can find more information at the homepage of our website, Judaism Unbound, where you can click on the Zoom gatherings button and sign up. So with that, we will call on all of you, as we always do, to please be in touch with us. We deeply appreciate the notes that you send our way. And you can be in touch in all of the following ways. There are our Facebook and Instagram and Twitter pages. All of those are just Judaism Unbound. You can go to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And you can email us at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. The last request we like to make is that we deeply appreciate any amount of financial donation that you can send our way. And you can do that via JudaismUnbound.com slash donate on either a monthly recurring basis or just as a one-time gift. So thank you so much for listening, and with that, this has been Judaism Unbound.